All right, take your Bibles, please. Thing with pages in it. It's got a cover. It has texture to it. You open it up. Look at words on paper. Sounds like this. You write in it. Put your name in the front of it. Oh, look at that. Whew, that's scary stuff. I might need to go print my slides. Jonathan, are you back there? Okay. Let's begin reading in verse number one of chapter four. Uh, The word four. For behold, the day comes, or is coming, or cometh, that shall burn as an oven. All the proud, yea, all the do wickedly, shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, all of Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let's pray. Father, would you bless the reading of your word, the preaching of truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that looks a little awkward. (laughs) Um, Jacob Graves, come up here right now. We'll pray for you, brother. Um, All right, gentlemen, if you're going to come help us lay hands on this young man, do that. Jacob, are you going to Afghanistan? Yep. And um, we, we don't ever send someone out without having hands laid on them. It is a symbolic gesture of our um, deep desire for God to do a work of protection in their lives. Dear God, we are assembled to ask that you would protect this young man from harm, that you would surround him with your mighty angels, that they would go before him to his flanks above, below, and behind, that you would give him an amazing sensibility to the presence of the Holy Spirit, that he would have a sixth sense of danger, that you would guide him as a leader, that you would fill him with wisdom, that when his mouth opens, it would be helpful, instructive, edifying. We pray, God, that you would give him eyes to see and ears to hear. We pray for an end to the mission in Afghanistan. We pray, Father God, for protection, that your work would be done through this servant. We pray for his personal purity downrange, that he would have an awareness of when the sinfulness is occurring and avoid those locations, that you would protect him from sexual temptations, material temptations, that you would keep within his heart an awareness of his responsibility to 
follow the rules that are appointed above him and for him and that he would be an incredible testimony to the power of Christ, that you would bless his preaching ministry as a, as a spokesman for Christ in his team and in his unit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 All right, I see something on there that looks like PowerPoint slides. I want you to look in your Bibles with me, please, as we continue to mess around with the screen. I want to talk about the text, and then perhaps something will get up. If not, Bill will come up and finish the message for me. <laughs> Last week, we looked at verse uh, 4 through uh, the end, and we drew particular attention to the fact that this text is talking about a dreadful or an awesome or a terrible or a terrific, uh, amazing day of the Lord. We saw that in verse number 5. We saw that in verse number 1. In chapter 4, verse 1, the day comes. In chapter five, uh, 4, verse 5, the great and dreadful day. In the middle of all this discussion about the day of the Lord... Verse 4 has this amazing phrase that I want to just completely unpack today. And it says that unto you that fear my name. So if, if you're in this auditorium I, 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 and you have a healthy love and respect and awareness and adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father in heaven, the indwelling Holy Spirit, then Malachi says to you that the son of righteousness is going to arise and he's going to arise with healing in his wings. And I, I want to drive the entire sermon to get to this idea of the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. I want to talk about every possible aspect I can think of of the healing ministry of Christ in your life. The son of righteousness. So last Sunday we looked at this incredible chart I posted it on Facebook of all the references to the day of the Lord. And, and I noticed that the Authors, the apostles, used it interchangeably. The day of the Lord, the day of Jesus, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of God, the day of wrath, that day. And they're referring to a period of time that has these things going on in it. And so after describing all this judgment and all this burning, we find it interesting that verse number two has the S-U-N, not the S-O-N, the S-U-N. And this is the only time that we have a son, S-U-N, of righteousness. This is it. So there's got to be a lot of significance here. And I want to do my best to unpack to you all that's there. Look back at 3-2, please, with me. 3-2. Do you see where, once again, a reference to fire is used? But who, who may abide the day, the day of his coming? So we're still talking about his coming. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. The day of his coming. But in this case, the fire has a refining aspect to it. Notice the little last phrase, prepositional phrase. For he is like a refiner's fire. I'm looking at preposition 4. He is like a refiner's fire. So now we see, after talking about all the fire in verse number 1, that we got a reference to S-U-N. So we ask ourselves this morning, is Malachi talking about the first coming of Christ, as in the one that's already happened? Or is Malachi talking about the second coming of Christ? What's going on here? Has the Son of Righteousness already risen with healing in His wings? Or is He coming with 
healing in his wings. Which is it? Is it both? What's going on here? Well, this illustration on the screen, look at it with me, please, is an example of, I think, what's happening in this text. So with my green laser now, we changed from red to green, big improvement here. We're kind of getting really fancy around here. We have a prophet. Let's make this guy Malachi for the sake of discussion. And let's make that chapter four. I would submit to you that the best way to understand what's happening in this is, is that the prophet Malachi cannot see the gap here that we're currently living in. That this coming and this second coming is transparent to the prophet Malachi. That he's not able to distinguish the son of righteousness arising here and the son of righteousness coming here. That this gap right here that we're currently living in is not in his purview. He's not aware of that. If we were writing this text, we'd want to have little footnotes. First coming, second coming. Stick it in there. Put a little arrow there. Make it clear. They don't write like that. It's not important to them to communicate that. Probably the best example of this in the entire Bible is found in Luke 4. And so I'm going to ask you to go there one more time with me. And I've shown this to you before, but I'm doing it again because repetition is the glue to learning. And so I'd like you to look at Luke 4 with me, and I'd like you to look at Isaiah 61. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your own Bibles and mark on your text so that you don't forget this idea. Because a year from now, you won't remember the sermon, but you'll have the note that you wrote down in your Bible there to remind you. What I want to do is I want to compare Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, to Luke 4. And again, starting around verse 16. So I'd like you to go to Luke 4 first. And then we'll flip back to Isaiah 61. And then we'll go back to Luke 4. Those of you that don't have your Bibles, I'm going to put it on the screen for you. The paragraph, the large one on the left is Luke. The small one on the right is Isaiah. So let's read now. And he came to Nazareth. Now that he is Jesus. I'm reading in verse 16 of chapter 4 in Luke. You can follow along the screen if you don't have your Bible. Next week you'll have your Bible. He, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. Jesus went into the synagogue on the seventh day. And he stood up to read. And they delivered unto him the scroll or the book of the prophet. Your King James Bible has Isaiah, but it's Isaiah. Okay, the Greek is clear. There's no doubt about it. It's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book or the scroll, he found the place where it was written. Or he found a place where it's written. Now, take your Bible and go back to Isaiah 61. Flip back to Isaiah 61. This is what he's going to read to the church or to the synagogue, to the group of assembly. Verse 1. This is what Jesus reads. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, to set at liberty... Uh, to, to me, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I want to come back to that in just a minute. To proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. All right, you just read what he read. Now let's go back to Luke 4. Chapter, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To set, to, he sent me, now look at this exact verbiage. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now we just read about the Son of Righteousness coming with healing in his wings. And now we're reading that Jesus says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's appointed me to proclaim or preach the gospel to the poor. He's sent me to heal the brokenhearted. We're going to get there at the end of our sermon. Let's keep reading. To preach deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Now, now what did you want me to get from that, Pastor? We're way too deep, too early in the sermon. I wanted you to see 
that he did not say, and vengeance. He said nothing about the vengeance. Do you think it's because the Lord forgot what the scripture had to say? No. You don't think that's the issue? No. Do you think it's because the Holy Spirit lost track of what was supposed to be there? Luke gave us a partial recording of what happened? No. 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 So if it's not the first and it's not the second, then we have to conclude that there was a reason he didn't finish that. There's a reason. Because we would expect that you don't stop in the middle of a sentence, Dave. It says and. You, you, you expect, finish the sentence at least. He says nothing about the vengeance. I would submit to you that what the Lord Jesus was teaching us in that very example in Luke 4 is that there's more for me to do. And I'm going to do everything that I say right now in this coming. And I'm not mentioning the rest because that's not part of this coming. I'm not here this coming in Luke 4 to do vengeance. He doesn't go around executing people. He doesn't go around cutting people's heads off. He doesn't go around murdering people. He doesn't come with a two-edged sword. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He does everything that he says, and then he stops because the next coming is when he's going to do this. So we can expect that in Malachi chapter number 4, that we can see that there might be the same kind of division in Malachi 4. That that wouldn't be hard at all to see that part of what happens in 2 and 3 occurs in the first coming and the rest is left to come. All right, what I'm trying to, to explain, let me explain it one more time because I don't feel like I'm doing a good job at all. In verse number 2, But unto you that fear, my name shall be the Son of Righteousness. Arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked. I'm going to submit to you that the first half of verse number two is what Jesus did when he first came, and the second part is the vengeance that is yet to come. That right there in the middle of verse number two there, when it talks about with healing his wings, and then it says, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, treading down the wicked, that that is yet to happen. That the way in Luke 4 he stopped is the same kind of division that we could insert right there in verse two. So let me give you where I want to go and then let's see if we can get there. I'm going to try to show you that from the moment Jesus' ministry began, he just started fulfilling this. The Son of Jesus shall arise with healing in his wings right away. That as soon as his ministry started, he started healing people. And then I'm going to submit to you that he has an ongoing ministry of healing. That he is still presently healing and that he's going to keep that ministry going until it culminates in the final and ultimate healing when he wipes away all pain, all suffering, all sorrow. Right. That we have this colossal ministry of healing. That's what I want to try to communicate. That the son of righteousness held, healed the very first person. We don't know who that was. Or well, we could think about it. I could study it. I didn't prepare that. The very first, ask Bill, he'll know. The first person in the New Testament... And then he continues this ongoing healing ministry. And then he ascends to be with the Father. And he's on the right hand of the Father. But his healing ministry doesn't stop. He's still healing. And then he continues that ministry until he comes again. And then the ultimate healing ministry occurs when he wipes away all heart disease, all arthritis, all pain, all sorrow, all Alzheimer's, all sin. And we live forever in the new heaven and the new earth where there's no more need for healing. Right. That Jesus has this colossal healing ministry. And thus the Son of Righteousness shall arise with wings, with healing in his wings. So, Son, what should I learn from Son? Why doesn't Malachi just say Jesus? Why does he say Son? There must be a reason he put Son in there. It's not an accident. What should I learn from this? Right off the bat, let's learn that without the Son, there's no life. 
Without the sun, S-O-N, there's no life. No life. You might be think you're living, but you're actually dead. You're spiritually dead right now without the sun. The Colossians says that Christ is the one that holds it all together. That all things exist because of Him. So six things that the physical sun does. And let's see if we can draw some parallels. The physical sun makes growth possible. Without the sun, there's no growth, no photosynthesis. The physical sun brings vitamin D. That's why doctors are having to prescribe so much vitamin D because we're not outside enough. Take Facebook with you and get outside. Um, <laughs> The physical sun brings happiness. All we have to do is go several days without seeing the sun around here and you'll feel the gloom. That, that, whether you don't like it or not, that's a reality. We love to see the sun. The sun brings to us something. Uh, number four, the sun brings warmth. We know that. The sun brings light. I remember on more than one occasion when I was a soldier and we'd be out at Fort Bragg or Little Rock, Arkansas or all the many places that I went all over the place. Little Rock really stands out. And it was just a bone-chilling, miserably cold, freezing, why am I a soldier kind of night. You been there before? Okay. And you're like, I don't know what I signed up for, you know. And I'm going to tell you one of the absolute most glorious things that you can see after just sucking it up all night long in freezing, wet, cold, miserable weather is to see that sun begin to crest. You know what I'm talking about? Not if you're a soldier, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it brings therapy to your soul. It does. It, what? Bob writes, and we talk about that. And you see it cresting over, and you're just so thankful that the sun is coming out. So I'm not surprised that Malachi says, I'm going to use S-U-N to help you understand the incredible ministry of the S-O-N. So right off the bat, I'm going to argue that the sun brings light where there was darkness. That the sun, S-O-N, brings warmth where it's cold. That the S-O-N brings growth when there was no growth. That the S-O-N brings security when there was danger. And while I am using the phrase ball of fire for all you technical people out there, it's not actually burning, it's glowing, okay? You can Google that, but don't say that the sun burns. Say it glows and, and you'll be even more correct. <laughs> I'm going to argue that while there are some in the theological circles who call themselves preterists and who believe that Jesus has already come, in 70 AD, when he came in judgment against um, Jerusalem, that that coming is not the coming that Paul is writing about. Because Paul says, and to you are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So while I do believe that God did rain judgment down on Jerusalem in 70 AD for their act of crucifying the Lord, I don't think that that's the final coming. I'm going to argue that there's another coming. And when he comes this time, there'll be no doubt that it's Jesus. No debate. The angels, the flaming fire coming out of heaven, that's Jesus. That's him whom we looked upon, whom we pierced. There are three references to Jesus as light. I want to unpack them. The first one is the transfiguration. Very quickly, Matthew 17. His face did shine as the sun. Peter was there. See the sixth day, Jesus takes Peter. So Peter then takes that idea, turn to 2 Peter, and I want to show you how he unpacks it. Flip to 2 Peter. It's in the New Testament, towards the end of your New Testament. 2 Peter. We have Bibles in the bookstore. We sell them. They're $11. You can get one for yourself. You sure are harping on that. Let me tell you why I'm harping again today. I got a glorious email this week. It was amazing. Such an encouragement to me. This church member read the Facebook posting of the weekly note. And she said, when my father died, I went and found his Bible not his smartphone, his Bible. She actually took the time to send me pictures of the Bible. 
And she said, God used it to show me that I was lost and needed a Savior. And she came to Christ. Not an iPad, not a laptop. She went and found her father's Bible. Second Peter chapter number one, verse 16. For Peter writes, we have not, we the apostles, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came came such a voice from him, from the excellent glory, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in that holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn. And I don't want you to notice in particular the day star arise in your hearts. Amen. What are you jumping up and down looking like a fool for? I'll tell you why. Because I believe that Peter knew Malachi. That he knew that minor prophet. And then he connected the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings to the day star arising in your heart. That everything that Jesus did as that son of righteousness with healing in his wings when he was on the planet can be done for you. For you. That the son of righteousness can arise in your heart. And that you and I can experience the healing ministry of Christ. You say, what do I care about the healing ministry of Christ? I promise you, when they look you in the face and they tell you, you have breast cancer, you are going to care about the healing ministry of Christ. Amen. The healing ministry of Christ will matter to you. Amen. And while you may be relying on surgeons, you know they are, they are fallible. That's right. And you will be begging God Almighty to heal through drugs and through surgeons and any way he wants. You just want to be healed. Yep, that's right. And I'm just going to suggest to you for just a moment that we as Baptists, because we're afraid of the Pentecostals, have missed part of the healing ministry of God. That because that scares us and we see how it's abused, that we run away from it and we act like God's done healing. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's a mistake. Amen. That's right. That's right. And I'm going to try to unpack it in several ways. Would you turn back to Luke 1, please? Well, I've got to keep track of time. All right. We've got to move. Luke 1. I want to show you one more reference to Jesus as this light. Luke 1, please. I've got it on the screen. Let's start in verse 76. Okay. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. By the way, that's John the Baptist there. And by the way, um, Jesus says that John the Baptist is the Elijah. We did that several weeks ago. The Elijah that we talked about a few minutes ago in Malachi chapter 4. And thou, child, John the Baptist, who comes in the spirit of Elijah, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare the ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto the people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring... All right, let me show you this word right here. Day spring, I have it on the screen. This is Blue Letter Bible. It's the rising of the sun. The rising of the sun. So once again, I want to show you in Luke 1, I have a reference to Elijah, and I have a reference to the sun rising. And in Malachi 4, I've got the sun of righteousness arising in the ministry of Elijah on that great and dreadful day. What are you doing? 
I am doing my very best, Jacob, to connect the dots between the Son of Righteousness to Jesus Christ. I want everyone here to completely understand that the Son of Righteousness is the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that you can have the absolute confidence that Jesus has a healing ministry for you, sister. In your life. A healing ministry for you and your life. He's going to give light to them that sit in darkness in the shadow of the death and to guide our feet in the way of peace, which is exactly why I made particular reference to security. Paul said the brightness of the sun. John the apostle said the sun shines in the full strength. Again, three references to the sun. Matthew, Acts, and now Revelation, all of them referring to Jesus. And he's often compared to light. I'll put this chart in just a minute. Let me show it to you. I'll put this chart on Facebook uh, tomorrow. And it'll be a JPEG. And you can look in the Gospel of John to all the references to Jesus as light. So now the son of righteousness. One more time. There's no way that we're talking about the moon or a star or the sun. And the reason we can say that is there no way the sun can be righteous. It's a rock. Rocks aren't righteous. Wood's not righteous. This has to be an illustration to a person with the intent of teaching us something. Now, healing in his wings. This is what I was driving to. This is what I want to get to. I want to talk to you about four aspects of healing. Four aspects of healing. I want to talk to you about four aspects of healing. The first one is physical healing. The second one, real simple, is salvific healing, saving healing. I'm going to show you all these. The third one is emotional healing. And I'm going to call the last one complete healing. Complete. So the first one was physical. The second one, salvific. The third one is emotional. And the fourth one is complete healing. I'd like to show you all these. Let's start with the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. You know this great chapter. It's about Jesus Christ on a cross. That's what the entire chapter is about. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the revealed to the Lord? Uh, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. There's no form or comeliness that we should desire him. And when we see him, uh, when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I'm going to submit to you that is a prophetic reference to the healing ministry because I have a sin problem in my life, a sin problem, and I need that solved. Now, I want to show you a physical aspect, and I want to connect it back to Malachi. And if you want to unpack this some more, Bill did a message on this. What was the title of that message, Bill? Yeah, I'll give you a second, and then you, you'll remember it. Just give you a second. This came from Wednesday night. We were wondering, what's this wings about? Wings, like this kind of wing? What's going on with this word wing? Okay, that's a little odd. Wings? What, what are we talking about here? This word wing here could also be the corner or the edge of a garment. Okay, again, remember folks, we're not wearing pants in Jesus' day. We're wearing some kind of a long garment. It would be strange for us to wear it, but some kind of a long garment. And there's like these corners to the garment, this edge to the garment. I'm going to show you a text. Uh, let me grab the clicker and advance it. Matthew 9. Behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Now, I know that doesn't say wings. I got it. What you have to do is you have to look at the Greek and the Hebrew and make the connection. Do you remember the name of the message yet? Immediacy. Immediacy. 
I don't even know how to spell that word. I, it starts with an I, right? So put I-M-M and see what Google comes up. It'll finish it for you there. Immediacy. All right, I'm not a good speller. That's just the way it is, okay? I rely on those digital devices to help. Anyway, Bill unpacked this on a Wednesday night. It was very helpful for me. She came to him with herself and said, If I touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But Jesus turned about and said, When he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. And the woman was made whole that very hour. You know what she was? She was healed. You know what she touched? The wing of his garment, the corner of his garment, the edge of his garment. What are you doing? I'm trying to show you that Malachi 4 was fulfilled in a physical sense in this passage. So here's the four that I want to talk about. Physical, salvific, emotional, and complete. Physical, salvific, emotional, and complete. There are several references that are just shocking about the healing ministry of Christ. For example, Matthew 8. And he healed all that were sick. All. What is that about? I mean, can we infer from there that entire villages experienced healing? I mean, how big was his healing ministry? Should we just conclude that it's just what the pro, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke say? Because we've got some crazy reference to John that says if all that Jesus did was recorded, the books couldn't contain it. So how much healing occurred? How many blind were made to see? How many deaf could hear? How many lame were walking? Entire villages? I mean, really, the truth is we have no idea how much healing Jesus did. Everywhere, healing, healing, healing. So now when we think about that, are we neglecting something? Are we missing out? Do I need to spend more time praying towards faith that God's going to heal in marvelous ways through surgeons, medicine, however he sees fit? Matthew 12, and when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from hence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. And then Peter changes directions, and he uses this expression, again, referring back to Isaiah 53, who bear his own, bear his own self, bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now, would you agree with me that the context of that text is not physical healing? Would you agree with that idea? That if you look at the context of that, I don't get any sense that we're dealing with eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear, legs that don't work. I'm talking about a sin problem in that verse. I have a sin issue. And Jesus has the power to heal my sin issue. Wait a minute. If alcoholism is a disease, disease, could Jesus heal me of that issue, disease? Yes. Does he have the power to do that? Yes. yes. I can be delivered from an addiction through Jesus? Yes. Yes. That he can do a sanctifying work in my life? Yes. That I can run to Jesus and say, you are the son of righteousness. And according to Peter, you have arisen in my heart and I need some healing. That I can't use the cop out that I'm just addicted to window shopping? That he can heal me of my sin problems? I'm just an angry person. That's just the way it is. My daddy was angry. My great daddy was angry. And I'm just an angry person. Or is it possible to identify anger issues as a sin problem and then turn to the Savior and say you are the son of righteousness who comes with healing in your wings so come heal me. 
Am I, am, I, am I ridiculous just to limit it to eyes that can see, ears that can hear? Or does he have an amazing healing ministry? And we might have people in the church that are missing out on his healing. So how does the gospel heal? I want to draw to your attention from Isaiah 61, a connection that I think is critical. I want you to see what the text says. So look on the screen with me. Jesus stood up at the synagogue and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And as soon as he says that, the gospel to the poor is the way Luke renders that. The very next thing he talks about, immediately connecting it and to bind up the brokenhearted. I want to I I consider for a moment the degree to which Jesus has the power to heal people whose hearts have been broken. And I know in this room that there are broken hearted people. You've been crushed, crushed again. Your daddy abandoned you at birth and you grew up without a father. And you still have not gone over the fact that you don't have a father. You don't know where your father is. And your heart is crushed. You've been hurt by your spouse. And your heart is crushed. You have a broken heart. Your dad was abusive to you your entire life. Abusive, abusive, abusive. He didn't tell you he loved you. He didn't show you love. And you feel so angry with God for giving me such a hateful father. And your heart is broken. It's crushed. And you keep it to yourself. You don't share. You're in here. But you know it's there. Nobody knows, but you're there. And I want to tell you that Jesus can arise in your hearts with a healing ministry. You say, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're twisting the text. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Because Luke renders it with the word heal. And we know what a broken-hearted person is. And by extension, a friend of the congregation, by extension, had to come home Thursday night to find her husband dead. That's a traumatic thing. Ladies, can you imagine coming home? You find Bob dead. You're going to think about that. Was he dead? You love him and your heart is going to be broken. You get healing from Jesus. I'm talking about people who are wounded emotionally. I'm talking to soldiers this morning who are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm talking to soldiers this morning and church members who have anxiety issues, can't go into large crowds. Crowds bother them. Noises. I'm talking to soldiers who saw things in Afghanistan and Iraq and they wake up in the middle of the night and they're terrified. Have bad dreams. This is our church. This is the church that we minister in. Our members see horrific things and it creates trauma on their mind, on their heart. They're emotionally traumatized. I'm going to submit to you that we're not putting enough energy, enough focus, enough concentrated focus on the reality that the Son of Righteousness can arise with healing in His wings and heal your broken heart. That you don't have to go your entire life with bitterness and anger at God. That He can bring into your heart healing 
Yes, you didn't have a father. And yes, you resent the fact that you didn't have a father. But now you have a family of God and a heavenly father who's adopted you into his family. And you can begin to be ministered to. Yes, your husband hurts you. Yes, your husband hurts you again. And then he hurts you again. And he hurts you some more. And you're tired of being hurt. And your heart is broken. And I want to submit to you that the son of righteousness can arise in your heart with healing in his wings and bring healing into your heart. Now, golly. I'm going to submit to you that here's the problem. Just give me a couple more minutes. We try this with Jesus. This is how it works. I deliver a message like this. You pray a prayer, and it's not solved. Now, boom, it's not, I did it. I tried Jesus, and it didn't work. I heard the sermon. I was encouraged. I was motivated. I saw that maybe Jesus was the solution. I went to Jesus, and it didn't work. It didn't work. So you know what we do? We abandon Jesus and we go find a psychologist or a psychiatrist that's not gospel-centered, is not Christ-exalting. Not like you, Dr. Martin. I know that you're Christ-centered. I'm talking about secular psychologists who have no idea that Jesus can come with healing in his wings. They don't give a rip about Jesus. And we sit down with a the therapist or the counselor. We have post-traumatic stress disorder. We go to group therapy. And we... Get there, we try it one time, and it doesn't work. So we run to the counselor, we run to the therapist, and we say, it didn't work. And you know what he says? Of course, it's going to take time. So we give Jesus one shot, and we give the secular word 12 weeks. We go see the pastor for marriage counseling. We sit down, we get into it. We try, we pray, we try to be gospel-centered. We go back, Satan brings difficulty in, it doesn't work. And we go, see, I tried Jesus, it didn't work. And then we go find a secular marriage counselor to give us garbage. And we give him 14 weeks. (laughs) Why don't we give Jesus the same time? I'm going to come back to you, Jesus. I'm going to come back again. I believe by faith you have healing in your wings, and I'm not leaving until I'm healed. I'm going to keep coming back again and again, and I'm not going anywhere. Can you all think of a parable like that? I ain't leaving. Even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. And you know what he says? I didn't see any faith like that amongst the Jews. Now let's be clear. There is a place for prescription medication in the life of a Christian. All right, listen to me very closely. I'm still talking to you. As your shepherd, as your pastor, as a person who cares about you. But if I told you that I take two Tylenol, 500 milligrams, six times a day, seven days a week to control pain, you would say to me, Pastor, that may be excessive. You might want to find out the root of the problem. If I told you for the last three weeks I've been taking Tylenol six times a day, every four hours, for 21 days, you say, why are you taking that? What, what, what's causing that? Listen to me. I'm going to draw a parallel, please. We have Christians who are on antidepressant medicines with no end in sight. With no end in sight. And in the exact same way that you would suggest to me, you got to deal with the root problem. you got to figure out what's going on here. I'm going to submit to you that there may be a place for a little bit of medication for a short period of time, but Jesus is the solution. Yes. Jesus is the solution. 
that psychiatrists and psychologists, if it isn't gospel-centered, Christ-exalting, God-glorifying, it is only a band-aid. If you are looking for true and genuine healing, you're only going to find it in the great physician. He can heal your marriage. He can heal your issues with your father or with your mother. He can heal your family dynamics. You say, I came from a dysfunctional family. And I'm going to submit to you that the first dysfunctional family was Adam and Eve. And they've all been dysfunctional since the sin came. They're all dysfunctional. Because there's a sin problem. And the only solution, David, to sin is Jesus And by the way, since I'm standing next to David, he could give you a testimony about how Jesus provides healing because he grew up in the heart of dysfunctionalness. Can you say amen, brother? So you go see that prescription doctor. It's real clear. This is only temporary. Jesus is the great physician. He's the source of all healing. And you say... I'll try this for Jesus. That's it. I'm not going to get on long-term addictions here because Jesus is the physician that heals me. Say, why are you harping on this? Because people on antidepressants are prone to suicide. That's right. That's a statistical fact. And a shepherd who doesn't care about his sheep is not much of a shepherd. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus can bring healing to your life and to your marriage and to your family dynamics. How much healing? He'll heal until he comes again to bring the ultimate in healing when he wipes out sin and creates a new heaven and a new earth. And there's no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more Alzheimer's, no more brokenness, no more sin. The ultimate and complete healing. Let's pray. God Almighty, I pray that you would bring healing in your wings as you arise in the hearts and minds of every believer in this room. And if there's anyone in this assembly who's not saved, I pray that you would bring healing into their life through the power of the gospel. That you would heal their sin problem. That you would heal their emotional brokenness. That you would heal their post-traumatic stress disorder. That you would heal their battle fatigue. That you would heal their depression. That you, the great son of righteousness would arise in their marriage and bring healing to husbands and wives that have been at odds one with another, that the bitterness and the roots of darkness and sin would be eradicated by the power of your healing ministry. I pray that you would do a mighty work in your name, in Jesus' incredible and powerful name. Amen. You are dismissed because it's 1209.